Pomona, California. To Bristol, Tennessee. To Indiana's famed Indianapolis Raceway Park. Drag racing has become the fastest growing sport in America. It all began with a hot rod. You took an old car, souped it up. Mainly, that meant dropping a great big engine in a little bitty body. The combination was loud, and it went like crazy. Next, off came the fenders, the hood, the windshield, the side panels. The hot rod that used to be short and fat got long and skinny as the search for more speed better traction and quicker get alone. This evolution has spawned 75 species where they've been basically one. The weird shapes and wildly different sizes of today's cars have made a complex classification system necessary. As the fat fell off, muscles began to stick out all over. Engines got bigger and meaner and more powerful. And if one engine wasn't enough, you hooked up two. Muscles bulged until, like the beach boy who stands around all flexed and sexy looking, the hot rod, bristling with power, got muscle bound. The answer was the dragster. They laughed when inventor Don Garlitz sat down to play, but man, could he play. Suddenly, everybody was sending in for the Garlitz course to a speedier tomorrow. The dragster was the most all engine and no car, all muscle, no fat at all. It was boss. For glamour, there were the slick super stalkers. They were rich and good looking. They were class. Enter the engineers, the speed shop operators, the professionals. They had the secrets and the goodies. And they knew what to do. They knew how to coax. Whole new industries sprang up around drag racing's fantastic popularity. Drag racers sunk everything they had into their custom-built crates. Any modification was possible, depending on the rules of the class you wanted to run in. Tires play an important part in drag racing, the final connection between engine and asphalt. Just because all that fancy hardware has been assembled doesn't mean the car is ready to run. It's never ready. If you listen to the driver, there's always something that needs to be tightened or tuned or torqued. A car is never perfect. It can always be reworked. By the time a drag racer is through, everything on his car is custom made from top, if there is one, to bottom. And then it's time to put the months of work and worry of tuning and torquing to the test. You better be ready, because more than 100,000 people have paid their way into the drag strip at Los Angeles County Fairgrounds in Pomona, California, to see the first big meet of the 1965 racing season, the Winter Nationals. And what a show it was. The same quarter-mile strip that a driver straining to reach 190 miles an hour in eight seconds last year gave way to a rash of over 200 mile an hour, seven and a half second runs. In drag racing, speeds are so great, time so quick, and run so close that it takes equipment accurate to a thousandth of a second to catch the results. This year's Winter Nationals was remarkable for two reasons. First, a new system was introduced in the Top Stock Eliminator competition. In the past, Top Stock was limited to the big super stockers. But for the 1965 season, the action had been expanded to include the wild A factory experimental cars and the double A stockers. And to make everything equal, competition will be held under the NHRA handicap system, the slower class car leaving first. Bill Jenkins was the big winner under the new procedure with his super stock automatic 65 Plymouth. The second remarkable thing about the Winter Nationals was that the entire three-day meet was compressed into a single day. 
after rain and fog canceled out Friday's and Saturday's shows. Sunday, almost 4,000 time runs were made, over 700 miles of racing. Don Garlitz set a new record of 206.88 miles per hour through the finish line timing trap. 11 miles an hour faster than last year's best. Earlier, Art Malone had lowered the elapsed time record to 7.56 seconds. But the big news was Don Prudhomme's piloting the Hawaiian. put over 200 mile an hour, seven and a half second runs back to back and raced off of a top fuel eliminator trophy. Prudhomme predicted that the top fuel drivers would be hitting an incredible 210 miles per hour before the year was out. Let's see how accurate his prediction was. The second big meet of the year, the Spring Nationals was held in Bristol, Tennessee, in the heart of the hilly Piedmont region of southwestern Virginia and northeastern Tennessee. There isn't a level quarter mile in the whole area, but that hasn't stopped the local citizens from becoming drag racing fans. Nor has it stopped local sportsmen from building the finest, most modern drag racing facility anywhere. Everything about Bristol, from its four-story air-conditioned control tower and advanced timing system to its starting lights and quarter-mile strip, is the newest, the best. Where did they find 440 yards straight and level in this part of the country? Between two mountains, that's where. The one strong, unifying factor as drag racing went coast to coast was the drivers. All the top names from all over the country came to test the brand new Bristol Strip. First off, the Super Stalkers, the wild Detroit built dragsters, funny cars, now running in their own private category called the Match Bash. This was a no holds barred, make it as custom as you want category. And they tried everything with such famous names as the Golden Commandos, the Honker. Ronnie Sox, Dave Strickler, and Bob Harrop's flying carpet battling it out. Bristol also marked the world premiere of Hearst's wheel standing Hemi under glass. As the gas dragsters got the feel of things, a few adjustments for the high altitude were made, but not enough for over anxious drivers. Gordon Collette coasted through on an easy one as Dick Vest jumped the line. Another foul at the start is John Reed tied to anticipate the green. Ron Colson blasted through for the win. The second round of the match bash had Dave Strickler sitting it out, while the flying carpet just pulled the rug out from under the honker with a real heads-up run. What will be the effect of Bristol's mountain air on the big fuelers? The boys who run on those crazy nitromethane blends. Can they turn 200 miles an hour plus in under eight seconds here? Gentleman Joe Schubeck was a little too eager to find out, but you would be too if you were running against Connie Kalita. The red hot candy striped Rem Chargers rail from Ferndale, Michigan, with Don Westerdale guiding it to on the All-American Val Laporte from Tampa, Florida. In a straight head-to-head -head run, Westerdale turned 204.44 in 7.51 seconds. Jimmy Nix, who won the top gas trophy at Pomona, switched to fuel and lost to Don Garlitz. Both men were under eight seconds. The second round of the fuelers closed the way and it opened with Minneapolis's Tom Hoover coasting through for the win against a disqualified Ron Goodsall, who races out of Pomona, California. Time for the match bash finals. Dave Strickler won out over Bob Harrop, who jumped at the start. Strickler turned 130 miles per hour in 11.3 seconds. 
Dave, a Dodge driver from York, Pennsylvania, has been one of the top stock drag racers. He was Little Eliminator at the 1963 Nationals. With the funny cars out of the way, the 1964 Junior Stock World Champion, Mike Schmidt of Ridgecrest, California, beat out Bob Borkies of Springfield, Ohio in the Red Hot Top Stock action. With all the stock classes upgraded, the Top Stock Eliminator Trophy went to a 1964 Ford. The Junior Stock Eliminator Trophy went to Bill Hopper, a street eliminator finalist at the Winter Nationals. Third round for Top Gas, Gordon Collette roared into the final as Ron Colson red-lighted. Third round top fuel, the Ram Chargers versus Connie Kalita, who raised the top speed record to 209 miles per hour. With that kind of competition, Westerdale got trigger happy and Kalita rolled through another easy one. Tom Hoover versus Jimmy Nix. This was the wildest and tightest run of the Spring Nationals. Both cars were under eight seconds, but watch as Hoover wins and then bursts in the flame at the finish. His protective face mask and flame suit saved his life. The Street Eliminator final. Joe Cunningham got a handicap, but pulled it out on the top end over Dick Scheuer with a run of 87 miles per hour in 13.1 seconds. Little Joe Cunningham was pretty proud, too. Competition Eliminator saw a unique double winner situation with Glenn Blakely and Pete Schottinger sharing the title. Both had a top end speed of 141.5 miles per hour in 10.05 seconds. Top Gas Eliminator. In a solid heads up run, Gordon Collette pulled it out by a whisker, hitting 185.94 miles per hour in 8.47 seconds. He's the top top gas dragster driver in the land. Then it was Connie Kalita's turn in the top fuel final against little-known Maynard Rupp. Kalita had been getting a series of free rides as his opponents kept jumping the line. Maynard Rupp, with a clean getaway, was first to cross the finish line as both Rupp and Kalita topped 200 miles per hour in under eight seconds. This victory established Michigan's Maynard Rupp as a leading fuel dragster driver. The Winter Nationals in the West, the Spring Nationals in the East, and now the National Championships in the heart of the country. This is the payoff for drivers who have traveled the circuit from coast to coast. Don Prudhomme, top fuel eliminator at the Winter Nationals. Don Westerdale of the Ram Chargers. Connie Kalita and television star Tommy Ivo. But drag racing isn't just big names, it's everybody's sport. With a real love for cars, some skill, a lot of patience, a terrific desire to compete, and a few thousand bucks burning a hole in your bank account, you too can get your name in the papers, maybe even your picture. But before your dreams of glory can come true, your car must be inspected to determine what class it's going to run in. There were 70 classes at the Nationals. How could inspectors evaluate cars as individual and as unusual as these? How can they detect such subtle differences? After 11 years, the automotive experts of the National Hot Rod Association know where to look and what to look for. George Montgomery of Dayton, Ohio, is one of drag racing's expert drivers of long standing. In the 11-year history of the sport, George was one of its most popular early stars. He retired at 27, came back in 1963 at 30 to take middle eliminator honors at the Nationals, and is back this year driving Hearst's experimental gasser passer. The winning mechanic in each of the six eliminator categories will receive a set of Hearst magnesium wheels presented by Miss Hearst Golden Shifter. Fueled, lubricated, tuned, torqued, polished until you can see your face in any part, everything's ready to blast off for pay dirt. Some unintentional wheelies and one intentional one with Wild Bill Shrewsbury at the controls of the Hearst's Hemi Under Glass.
first round for the top fuelers and Maynard Rupp proves that his Bristol win was no fluke by beating Connie Kalita twice in a row. Second run, and Rupp draws Tommy Ibo. Look out, Rupp loses it, but Ibo stays on course, hitting almost 206 miles per hour. Don Westerdale locks horns with Buddy Cortinez. Both cars go over 200 miles per hour with the Ram Chargers hitting 210.76. Last race in round two, and Don Garlis jumps the start against Tommy Hoover. Garlis is out early. Another improvement that came with the dragster is the fire suit. Both gas and fuel dragster drivers wear them, as well as some of the competition eliminator drivers. These fire protective coverings, face masks, gauntlets, and suits completely protect the driver from head to foot. It's hot inside all that, even for a short stay, but chrome long johns have saved many a life. With the sanctioning of the exotic nitromethane blends for the big fuel dragsters, the fuel check for all other cars has become even more important. Each car's fuel is spectroscoped, tested for specific gravity, and the results are recorded. For everybody but the fuelers, it must be pump gas. Third round top gas eliminator. And one Colson Stiletto puts away Mark Pieri's. Why not? Next, it's Phil Hobbs, 1963 top gas car owner versus national record holder George Bolthoff. Hobbs goes into the semifinals against Colson. Top stock round three. Dave Strickler, the match bash winner from Bristol, eliminates Bristol's top stock eliminator, Mike Schmidt. As the cars file back to the staging area for the next round of eliminations, half of them get timing cards giving them their winning time and speed. The other half pack it up. 1,167 entries have been boiled down to 70. And those 70 down to the semi-finalist in six eliminator categories. In order to give all class winners an equal chance for the top eliminator titles, a handicap starting system goes into effect when unequal classes are competing in the same eliminator bracket. For example, in the junior stock eliminator semifinals, Bill Spanakos gets the green light first. Dave Koppel with the more powerful car doesn't wait long enough for his go signal and is disqualified. The street eliminator semifinals. Carl Kirk with a big handicap puts on a great top in effort and outruns Rufus Boswell. In the other street semi, Tom Holderbaum with another large handicap slides into the grass, giving Ferdinand Apple's storming bull a clear, easy victory. Competition eliminator semis. Pete Schattinger, one of the finest at Bristol, gets a good jump, but has to hustle to hold off a hard-charging Bill Smith. Francis O'Connor is last out of the hole against Vinny Goodmaster, but look at that top end burst. Third round for the top fuelers. Tommy Ivo gets a chance to rest this time as Jim Dunn jumps the start. Hoover, on the other hand, gives it a real go as Don Westerdale's Ram Charger loses its fire. <laughs> Round four for the top stocks. Unknown Bud Schellenberger keeps rolling as Dave Strickler is disqualified. Bill Lawton, factory experimental eliminator at the Winter Nationals, runs heads up with Joe Smith. It's even all the way with Lawton just pulling it out through the trap. Bob Kobo draws a bye. In the stock semis, Lawton comes up against Kobo, but gets a bad bouncing start as Kobo smokes it through all the way. Two 1964 Fords running for the top stock eliminator trophy. It's even all the way with Schellenberger just pulling it out in 12.2 seconds for the top end speed of 114 miles per hour. 
the junior stock final, John Callender versus Bill Spanikos. It's another head-to-head -head run with Callender just edging out Spanikos in 15.3 seconds with a run of 88 miles per hour. In the competition eliminator finals, Pete Schattinger has an easy time of it against Francis O'Connor, turning 120 miles per hour in 10.4 seconds. Street eliminator finals, Bert Knapfel and Carl Kirk. Kirk has a big handicap, but comes on strong and almost takes the storming ball, but not quite. They don't come any closer than that. Knapfel turned 105.5 miles per hour in 13.2 seconds. Top gas semifinal. Phil Hobbs and Ron Colson go at it head to head with Hobbs blasting into the final against Gordon Collette, the class winner who had the honor of sitting it out. And here it is, Hobbs, owner of 1963's Top Gas Eliminator versus Collette, 1964's Top Gas Eliminator. Hobbs takes it back in 65 for the first comeback win in drag racing history. The car's co-owner, Ken Harada, accepts congratulations from Wally Parks, president of the National Hot Rod Association. Top Fuel semifinal, Tommy Ivo versus Tom Hoover. TD Tommy Ivo stays in there all the way to win. Now he'll meet the class winner, Don Prudhomme, the top fuel eliminator at the Winter Nationals in the final. Prudhomme gets the jump this time and really lets it out, hitting 207.33 miles per hour in 7.5 seconds. What a finish! Don Prudhomme, top fuel eliminator at the Winter Nationals, and now at the Nationals, is truly the top fuel eliminator in the nation. This has been a tremendous year for everyone associated with drag racing, and especially for the more than six million fans who go to 2,000 plus drag meets a year at over 125 drag strips from coast to coast. Drag racing is America's youngest and fastest growing sport. What about next year and the year after that? The fuelers reached 210 miles per hour in 7.47 seconds as Prudhomme predicted. Where will they go now? How fast can they go? And how quick? Is there a limit to any car? You can bet there'll be more people than ever trying to find out and millions more flocking to see them go.